everyone. Welcome back to Deep Dive. This is episode number seven. And today I'd like to focus on grand pauses uh, or fermatas or any kind of rests that we find in music. So you might be thinking, what's so interesting about silence? All silences are the same, right? The lack of sound, lack of music. But um, when you really look into them, I think different pauses stand for different expressions and composers really write them for different reasons. We always um, start out with silence before we begin uh, playing a certain piece. And of course, at the end of the piece, we return to that silence. And I think that silence before and after a performance is a quiet silence. Um, there is, um, it's an empty canvas. Anything can happen and any sound can come out of them. So in the beginning of the performance, I really try to listen to that silence and how that first note of the piece um, compares in relation to that silence. Of course, it's gonna be a little bit louder than the silence, no matter what dynamic, but um, that the initial entrance for me is very significant. But let's focus on what happens when the, when the rests and grand pauses are put in in the middle of the pieces. Let's go. The first kind of rests I'd like to talk about exists in between phrases. So these are used by composers to make a break in between two sentences. Uh, often within that um, rest, the performer is supposed to take uh, a breath in. It's kind of an upbeat um, and you need to take that breath in order to go on with the second phrase. For example, in the very beginning of Beethoven's third piano concerto, we have three scales happening. One, two. So the third scale really goes elsewhere, but because there are three of them, um, I'm getting the hint from Beethoven that he wants me to build tension, build drama and there that separation in between um, allows me to go da -da 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 -dum, da -da 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 -dum. in that break I really take um, an actual breath in order for me to um, get prepared for that next scale without it you would just have a continuous um, scale going up but because of the break it um, it gives it a totally different feeling and I think it adds to the drama that he wants to create. It's a big um, the pianist entrance after the orchestra's been playing. Um, it's opening for about five minutes and pianist is sitting there getting all cold again <laughs> with clammy hands. And this is the first statement I get to make. And I think that's, um, that rest plays a big role in making this um, a very significant uh, statement. Another place where I seem to be taking an actual breath with the presence of a rest is at the very end of the first movement cadenza. wondering where is this rest and it's very very small but in my opinion very significant there 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 are these small separations between two note phrases taram rest taram rest Bottom. So these little rests, I find myself literally taking a breath to go on to the next one because what comes before that is significant. It's very virtuosic. Um, it's the end of the cadenza where pianist plays by um, herself himself before the orchestra comes in. <laughs> Thank you. 
a little bit of that bridge um, between something very virtuosic and dramatic and something that gets very, very, very soft for that mysterious entrance um, of the orchestra after the cadenza. So in these, you have to go from everything to nothing in a way. And this breath is sort of signifying um, your urge to hang on to that higher energy level only to fall. There's a, something a little bit tragic about this, this small rests in between um, these little figures uh, that makes you sort of, um, um, you're trying again and again to hang on to that virtuosity only to fall to final trill that um, moves the piece forward. So I think that is a very small uh, rest within a piece, but for me, a very significant one. Sometimes composers use rests to interrupt the flow, just like in Once Upon a Time. This is a piece in the lyric pieces by Edvard Grieg. ended up, these two things, in my opinion, have very, very little in common, and they're really separated um, by not much. It's a very short time, but by interjecting these silences into a very dancey part, we hear so one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. This serene part at the end is how the piece begins. It's as if it's saying once upon a time, and it's like the narration um, unfolding, and this little dancey bit, this exuberance in the middle of the piece sort of breaks away from the narration. And I feel that this very interesting transition is about Grieg saying, no, 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 that's not how the story goes at all. Let me start over. Once upon a time. So there is a real break um, in the narration, um, in my opinion. And instead of just getting softer or coming down in, um, in pitch somehow, he starts to interject this dance by just pure silence. In my mind, this could also be um, like uh, someone trying to tell a story and they got distracted by a, a parade or a carnival going by um, because it starts quite softly and then it grows to this big party and maybe these um, little silences are them driving away and you kind of hear them and don't hear them then hear them and don't hear them and they simply disappear and you only are left to tell your story from the beginning again whatever the narration um, that's for the performer to decide but I feel like these little interjections in, um, in silence really change the mood and they're very important. Um, as a performer, you really do need to um, count and listen to them as if they're music because if you just um, think of it as silence like I just did, um, this whole section coming down to nothing would make very little sense. Um, so in my mind, I actually think of every single beat in my mind as I'm getting slower and slower. So... important that these rests sort of um, get relaxed in tempo just like the music because it really is um, interwoven into the texture and um, these would not make any sense if it was just a, a blank canvas in the middle of the piece. My next two examples come from Dvorak and Chopin. You probably noticed I changed. <laughs> This is a wardrobe change in order to explain my next point. 
Uh, sometimes uh, when there is a, a melody happening um, in the music, composers uh, interrupt the melody and gives the audience silence as if uh, the music has abandoned or disappeared for a split second and in order for that same music to reappear and continue its course. So why does this interruption happen? Let's listen to the music, then decide. So in Dvorak's Ninth Symphony, in the second movement, um, Going Home, it uh, has a lyric to it. Uh, D Dvorak's student uh, wrote it as, as a song, but the melody first appears in the very beginning in the English horn section, and then at the end of the movement, the strings play this melody. The piece continues. So these silences, I think, are one of the most heartbreaking things um, I experience when I hear Dvorak's Ninth Symphony. And I think it stands for um, a sense of nostalgia, sense of loss. Maybe there's a gap in your memory, or maybe you remembered something and it's so close to your heart that your heart skips a beat or you just need that split second to um, pull yourself together in order to go on with the melody. Whatever it is, I think this kind of um, silence um, within this beautiful um, melody is um, incredibly poignant and full of meaning. And as performers, um, we need to uh, really think about if we're gonna uh, prepare the silence, like get slower going into it, or just go into it like nothing's happening, like you don't know that it's gonna drop out, and then leave the audience um, in awe that way, or um, it just really changes depending on um, your how you're feeling um, during that performance. But whatever it is, in that silence, even though I'm barely moving, I really, feel like these feathers still have that little bit of movement and that, that's so important in a silence in uh, music making. It can't just come to a stop like that. It's not you walk into a wall and then you just um, stop moving. Everything has a little bit of a wave and when the music is playing and suddenly you get that silence, um, you really still have to sort of feel that wavelength, feel that energy moving, or that even the slightest momentum um, needs to be present. And as um, listeners and performers, we have to really um, actively listen to that silence to really weave out of that silence or really lead into it um, the best we can in order for the piece to, to make sense to the audience. Next example um, is from Chopin's Ballad Number no. 2. There is a section that is just like the Dvorak 9 that I just played for you, where the melody just simply decides to drop out. Um, but it's, it's a little bit different in this case because the, in, in silence, the music um, keeps playing. And so it's, it's almost like you see this big canvas of sound and then certain parts are just cut out. So the original melody goes like this. 
music really continues. Um, I'm, I'm singing that original melody, even if the music isn't there. It's like when I first heard it, I was, um, I was actually shocked when the music started to play again, because within that silence, I was um, still hearing things. And that's really the magic. When you hear this serene melody that's um, a bit repetitious in nature, you really seem to feel that, um, that lilt and that, um, that lyricism, and even when it drops, it's like you, you can sort of feel its energy in the air and just kind of um, you're, you're floating in it um, until uh, Chopin grabs your hand again and leads you back into the melody. And I think those um, rests in these pieces are just so gorgeous. Next example I'd like to play for you comes from Gershwin's Concerto in F. This is the very last passage of the concerto and there is a big dramatic silence and I think this one plays a different role than any of the other ones. So it goes like this. <laughs> Actually, within it, there's a big um, cymbals or gong playing. <laughs> so, and but no one else is playing, and my hands are really up in the air because we go into a very dramatic section after. <laughs> sort of letting go and giving everything you've got uh, finale section and um, this rest this grand pause except for the the cymbals player um, is sort of I, I imagine it's kind of like when you're on the plane and taking off I used to do that a lot <laughs> um, you go up 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 and then you go into the clouds and then that's when the silence is. You suddenly don't see anything. You don't see anything above or, up or below or above. And um, after this grand pause with this dramatic clashing chord, that's when you sort of just soar above and suddenly you are on top of the world. And I think there is that um, really that change in energy level, even when um, it's just the silence. And I think it's... Um, this, this um, is also interesting because uh, Gershwin gives, um, writes kind of a wrong note after the big um, grand pause. He should really be going here. If this is the last chord, that should be the resolution. But instead of F minor, F, Right, right note. So instead of, but there's there's a clash there, which I think is just um, it's uh, so fun to play because <laughs> after that big um, cloud, 
uh, to what you see after that is a big surprise. And even if um, I know what's happening, it's just a, a, a great clash to hear when I get there. I'd like to talk about just one more example of how the rests are used. In the very end of Greek's lyric pieces, let's go back to Once Upon a Time, we have this. Now let me play it without the rests. rests are here. Rest. Rest. So why is that significant and why is there a rest? In my opinion, it, this ends pretty regularly. Five dominant chords, E minor, going back home exactly where we started. So that makes sense. But this piece has a four quarter notes in one measure. So it's one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One. So if it were to come on one and three, it would sound quite square. Instead, it's one, two, three, four. But that's not the important part. The last chord is not on a downbeat. So it's three, four, one. So one is tied over. In my opinion, when the composer doesn't write the last chord in a dominant beat, such as um, beat one, um, and he sort of scoots it over, so the last note is a little bit before the downbeat, that means um, this is not a peaceful ending. Uh, this really signifies um, there's not really this peaceful um, ending and there, there's still some kind of tension that, um, that is created by playing the chord on a weak beat and then just um, tying it over to a strong beat. There's a bit of a struggle and this is a way of, of Grieg telling me don't sit so comfortably on that last last note. Feel the tension and it should be a little bit voiced, a little bit um, ominous sounding, and it's not a final the end. So it's, it's, it's a mere um, end of a phrase and I really need to um, sort of savor that fact and go to the silence after um, and allow the audience know that um, this is not a peaceful ending. So today we've explored all different kinds of rests. I hope um, after today's deep dive, you feel some pauses or some rests or silences hold a lot of meaning and contribute so much to the, the piece. And they're as important as um, actual music. Sometimes they're even more important in guiding the piece in a certain direction. If you haven't heard of it already, there is a piece called Four Minutes and 33 Seconds by John Cage. It's in three movements and all three movements are silent. It's full of rests. And it's been um, quite a surprise when it first premiered and it's been um, interpreted in many different ways. So if you're interested, remember to look that up. It will be a great journey to, <laughs> to know about that for the first time. Thank you for listening and I will see you next week.